Welcome to Plato's Pod, where we engage in a group discussion on selections from the complete works of Plato, the philosopher and geometer who wrote nearly 2,400 years ago. Today is June 23rd, 2024, and I'm your host, James Myers. It's an honor to welcome in discussion members of the Toronto, Calgary, and Chicago philosophy meetup groups. Whether you've been with us before or here for the first time, whether you have experience with or are new to Plato's works, I encourage you to add your voice to our dialogue. This is the 11th meeting of our series on Plato's longest dialogue, The Laws, and today we're examining Book 9. And as I've done before, I'll again be joining the participants in discussion and handing the role of moderator to Michael Fitzpatrick, who has also prepared today's notes. So with gratitude to Michael for organizing this meeting, before I turn the microphone over to him, I just want to remind everyone that, as always, to contribute your thoughts to the discussion, please use the Raise Hands feature in Zoom. And for everyone's benefit, please relate your comments and opinions to Plato's text. So that everyone has a chance to speak, Michael will call on you in the order that hands are raised, using first name only. Once we finish recording in two hours, we invite anyone who wishes to remain online for Plato's Cafe, a casual half-hour discussion on Plato or philosophy in general. So over to you, Michael. Welcome, everybody. Today, we are discussing selections from Book 9 of Plato's Laws, in which the Athenian turns the legislative purpose towards a particularly difficult area of governance, how to promote justice when some members of a society commit evil acts. A traditional answer has been that whoever is in power should punish the wrongdoers. But punishment in this pure retributive sense does not actually improve the wrongdoer, nor does it improve society. So it seems to do evil in response to evil. If you look at the title page quote on your handout from the Republic, which I will now share on the screen, you'll see that it recalls that famous moment where Socrates says that it is not the case that a just person should do good to their friends and evil to their enemies. For a just person should never do evil to anyone for any reason. Therefore, the just person cannot act from a spirit of revenge or getting back at someone who harms them. Like all Platonic ethical principles, this perspective has a political equivalent. Just as the just person cannot undertake revenge as a form of justice, so the state cannot undertake retribution either. I suspect we are so familiar today with modern judicial systems that we have lost the radicality of the idea here that in response to evil deeds being done, we should do good to the evildoer. In Plato's day, political sovereigns had no responsibility at all to respond to evil with good. To them, Plato's proposal would sound like someone saying to a kid who was just bullied, now let's do what's in the best interest of both you and your bullies. Even today, we can struggle with this idea, often insisting that we should be solely on the side of the victims, not the victimizers. But Plato is interested in a harmonious society, one that is built around the common good. And the only way to do this is to will the good of everyone in the society, even those who commit unjust acts. So how to do this? In contrast to retribution, Plato has the Athenian develop at least four other motivations for justice that will be appealed to as goods the state can seek in the wake of injustice. The two higher goods are reparations and rehabilitation. Reparations seek to undo the damage caused by the wrongdoing, typically through the wrongdoer making some kind of restitution. Rehabilitation seeks to help the wrongdoer move from a more vicious soul to a more virtuous soul and restore their place in society. Sometimes these goals are not easily available or they need to be complemented by the two lower goods, which are deterrence and protection. Deterrence uses penalties to deter the wrongdoer from further action, as well as discouraging others from engaging in similar behavior. Protection is the recognition that if all else fails, at least the rest of society should be protected from further acts of wrongdoing. We want to explore how all of these are goods the state can impose in the face of injustice, and in particular, how these goods might be operative in the particular cases the Athenian considers in this chapter. Heinous acts. Heinous acts are particularly egregious acts of injustice that the Athenian takes to often signal a particularly diseased soul. Some of these acts are severe enough to warrant the death penalty, he suggests, because the soul in question cannot be rehabilitated at all. 
I don't think it will be productive for us to impose our modern views about death penalties on the text. Instead, we should focus on the relationship between the spirit of the laws and the letter of the laws. The death penalty prescriptions are the letter of the law that are proposed for exactly one and only one society, Magnesia. The Athenian does not even expect these will be appropriate laws for other neighboring city-states of that time. The extreme relativity of the written laws is underwritten by the spirit of the laws, the preambles, which embody the more universal principles of justice that should translate across cultures and eras. It is there we want to place our attention. What kind of principles is the Athenian giving voice to? Is it true that some people cannot be rehabilitated towards virtue? And how might the spirit of the law manifest for us today as we think about the strengths and weaknesses of our own legal codes? So I'm gonna to turn to our first theme, which focuses on the preambles. There's some really interesting instances of how the preambles are to work throughout the text that uh, show up here in book nine. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to read both readings that are selected under our first theme here so that we can get sort of the full text in front of us and then discuss. So please, if you have thoughts or reactions to the first reading that I'll give here, please make notes so that we can come back to those after I finish both readings. So our first reading comes from 853b to 854e, and it's a single line of text given by the Athenian. The very composition of all these laws we are on the point of framing is, in a way, a disgrace. After all, we're assuming we have a state which will be run along excellent lines and achieve every condition favorable to the practice of virtue. The mere idea that a state of this kind could give birth to a man affected by the worst forms of wickedness found in other countries, so that the legislature has to anticipate his appearance by threats, this, as I said, is in a way a disgrace. It means we have to lay down laws against these people to deter and punish them when they appear on the assumption that they will certainly do so. However, unlike the ancient legislatures, we are not framing laws for heroes and sons of gods. The lawgivers of that age, according to the story told nowadays, were descended from gods and legislated for men of similar stock. But we are human beings, legislating in the world today for the children of humankind. And we shall give no offense by our fear that one of our citizens will turn out to be, so to speak, a tough egg whose character will be so hard-boiled as to resist softening. Powerful as our laws are, they may not be able to tame such people, just as heat has no effect on tough beings. For their dismal sake, the first law I shall produce will deal with robbery from temples, in case anyone dares to commit this crime. Now, in view of the correct education our citizens will have received, we should hardly want any of them to catch this disease, nor is there much reason to expect they will. Their slaves, however, as well as foreigners and the slaves of foreigners, may well make frequent attempts at such crimes. For their sake, principally, but still with an eye to the general weakness of human nature, I'll spell out the law about robbery from temples and about all the other similar crimes which are difficult or even impossible to cure. Following the practice we agreed earlier, we must first compose preambles in the briefest possible terms to stand at the head of all these laws. Take a man who is incited by day and kept awake by night by an evil impulse which drives him to steal some holy object. You might talk to him and exhort him as follows. Let me just pause and say what I'm about to read now is the preamble itself. So this is the text that's going to be written in as part of the laws, even though it's technically not itself a law. So here's the preamble. My dear fellow, this evil impulse that at present drives you to go robbing temples comes from a source that is neither human nor divine is a sort of frenzied goad 
innate in mankind as a result of crimes of long ago that remained unexpiated. It travels around working doom and destruction, and you should make every effort to take precautions against it. Now, take note of what these precautions are. When any of these thoughts enters your head, seek the rites that free a man from guilt. Seek the shrines of the gods who avert evil and supplicate them. Seek the company of men who have a reputation in your community for being virtuous. Listen to them as they say that every man should honor what is fine and just. Try to bring yourself to say it too. But run away from the company of the wicked with never a backward glance. If by doing this you find that your disease abates somewhat, well and good. But if not, then you should look upon death as the preferable alternative and rid yourself of life. So that ends the preamble. Now the Athenian moves into stating the actual text of the law. These are the overtures we make to those who think of committing all these impious deeds that bring about the ruin of the state. When a man obeys us, we should silently omit the actual law. But in cases of disobedience, we must change our tune after the overture and sing this resounding strain. If a man is caught thieving from a temple and is a, a foreigner or slave, a brand of his misfortune shall be made on his face and hands and he shall be whipped the number of lashes to be decided by his judges. Then he shall be thrown out beyond the boundaries of the land naked. So that's the text of the law. And then in parentheses, the Athenian says, perhaps paying this penalty will teach him restraint and make him a better man. After all, no penalty imposed by law has an evil purpose, but generally achieves one of two effects. It makes the person who pays the penalty either more virtuous or less wicked. So that ends the first set of readings. Now I'm going to read the second set of readings, and then we can discuss both. The second set is 857b to 858c. We return to our discussion between Clinius and the Athenian. Clinius asks, how on earth can we be serious, sir? In saying that it makes no odds whether a person's theft is large or small or whether it comes from sacred or secular sources. And what about all the other different circumstances of a theft? Shouldn't a legislator vary the penalties he inflicts so that he can cope with the various categories of theft? Athenian, that's a good question, Clinius. I have been walking in my sleep and you have bumped into me and woken me up. You have reminded me of something that has occurred to me before, that the business of establishing a code of law has never been properly thought out, as we can see from the example that has just cropped up. Now, what am I getting at? It wasn't a bad parallel we made, you know, when we compared all those for whom legislation is produced today to slaves under treatment from slave doctors. Make no mistake about what would happen if one of those doctors who are innocent of theory and practice medicine by rule of thumb were ever to come across a gentleman doctor conversing with a gentleman patient. This doctor would be acting almost like a philosopher, engaging in a discussion that ranged over the source of the disease and pushed the inquiry back into the whole nature of the body. But our other doctor would immediately give a tremendous shout of laughter, and his observations would be precisely those that most doctors are always ready to trot out. You ass, he would say, you're not treating the patient, but tutoring him. Anybody would think he wanted to become a doctor rather than to get well again. Clinius responds, and wouldn't he be right to say that? The Athenian says, perhaps he would if he were to bear in mind this further point, that anyone who handles the law in the way we are now is tutoring the citizens, not imposing laws on them. Wouldn't it be equally right to say that? Perhaps so, Clinius says. However, at the moment, we are in a fortunate position. How do you mean? I mean, the lack of any necessity to legislate we are simply carrying out our own review of every kind of political system and trying to see how we could put into effect the absolutely ideal kind 
as well as the least good sort that would still be acceptable. This is particularly true of our legislation, where it looks as if we have a choice. Either we can examine ideal laws if we want to, or again, if we feel like it, we can look at the minimum standard we are prepared to put up with. So we must choose which course we want to take. Clinius responds, this is a ridiculous choice to give ourselves, my friend. It's not as if we, legislators forced by some irresistible necessity to legislate at a minute's notice without being allowed to put the business off till tomorrow. We, God willing, can do as bricklayers do or workmen starting some other kind of erecting. We can gather our materials in no particular order and then select and select at leisure the items which are appropriate for the forthcoming construction. Our assumption should be, therefore, that we are constructing something, but not under any constraint. We work at our convenience and spend part of the time preparing our material, part of the time fitting it together. So it would be quite fair to describe our penal code as already partially laid down, while other material for it lies ready to hand. So that concludes our first set of readings. And I want to now open up the queue for people to raise their hands and ask questions. Um, again, you can talk about either of the two texts. But I think to start off with, we should kind of focus our thinking on this approach of having preambles in the laws, which are written in this very second personal way where they're being addressed to a particular person in a particular situation that function for the purpose of tutoring citizens on the laws, right? This passage we just saw here that we're tutoring citizens, not imposing laws on them. Now, let's be clear. The Athenian throughout our readings here on Plato's pod has been willing to impose laws. So we're not saying there's no exercise of coercive force. But he is saying that we're striving for an ideal where as much as possible, the letter of the laws themselves are unnecessary because the spirit of the laws evoked through these preambles appeals to the reason of people and invites them to follow what the law says of their own volition through the exercise of their own reason. So I think it'd be interesting to hear people's reaction to either the particular preamble that we saw in the first passage or this larger idea of tutoring citizens not imposing laws on them in the second passage. James, go ahead and start us off. Well, thanks for that reading. Actually, there was a really interesting point that I hadn't really caught on to before until you read it, and that was the part at, uh, I think it was 854b, uh, where the Athenian says that uh, this badness in us is a frenzy goad innate in mankind as a result of crimes long ago. And that one, it really reminds me of the end of this book, at the end of this book, 881a, where, and I don't think that's in today's reading, but it says that death is not an extreme and final penalty you know, the sufferings in store in the world to come are much more extreme. And so here, I think we really have, when they're saying that they need to establish the basis or the foundation for the laws, I think what is being said here is that we don't know the foundation of the laws, that it goes really back to earlier generations of souls. You know, there's these cycles and one soul kind of remembers what's happened in the past. And that's how these, uh, you know, crimes long ago, I think, uh, kind of arose. And so we have to sort of use reason, which in book 10, the Athenian says is at the center of the universe. And as Plato says, is at the center of of our own soul, reason moderates need and desire. So it just kind of struck me that this is is something that this long ago thing is that it, it, it's innate in us and that we need to overcome that with reason. So it, it just kind of struck me as that connection to the end at 881A where it, death is not the final and extreme penalty. So I think he's saying that there's more in store if we don't correct things now. Thank you. Yeah, this is such a great 
passage, uh, this image of the frenzied goad, I, I think one of the things we should really take away from this particular passage is the realism, again, that drives the way Plato sets up these dialogues. He doesn't have a picture of this, again, humanity as sons of gods, as he says um, in, in the reading here, that instead we have a humanity that has a kind of curse on it or a kind of pollution in our nature that makes it very difficult for us to, well, I shouldn't even say that, it makes it almost impossible for us to start from a place of virtue. And that's why the overarching theme of the whole Platonic canon is virtue is not something you accidentally fall into or that you are born by nature having or something like that. Virtue has to be taught and practiced, not just because there's something wrong with you, but because you are an inheritor of this human history that has this pollution in it. And that has to be overcome. Darren? Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, Michael brought up a lot of uh, big points already. Because this refers back to something from book four on the real doctors, what real doctors would do versus the fake doctors, which are, you know, just the slaves who pretend to be doctors. I think it might be nice to just maybe like look at that passage again, too, because I think it really informs what is going on here as well. And I like it when there's cross references in Plato's own texts because he throws so much at us. So if he's like repeating things, then um, it's probably significant. So I just want it's, you know, it's not that long. So this is from book four, 720 C. And I'm really glad we returned to this because I, I, I sort of remember that in our discussion of book four, we didn't quite delve into that much detail on this. At least I thought I wanted to do <laughs> focus a bit more on this. So I'm glad Plato brought it up again. So I'll just read this um, paragraph. Yeah, 720 uh, C. So he says here, this kind of doctor, this is the fake doctor. This kind of doctor never gives any account of the particular illness of the individual slave or is prepared to listen to one. He simply prescribes what he thinks best in the light of experience as if he had precise knowledge and with the self-confidence of a dictator. Then he dashes off on his way to the next slave patient and so takes off his master's shoulder some of the work of attending the sick. The visits of the free doctor, so this is like the real doctor with knowledge, by contrast, are mostly concerned with treating the illnesses of free men. His method is to construct an empirical case history by consulting the invalid and his friends. In this way, he himself learns something from the sick. And at the same time, he gives the individual patients all the instruction he can. He gives no prescription until he has somehow gained the invalid's consent. Then coaxing him into continued cooperation, he tries to complete his restoration to health. Which of the two methods do you think makes a doctor a better healer or a trainer more efficient? So, you know, that's we probably <laughs> can figure out, you know, how Plato responds to that. You know, it's the free doctor. And I, I believe in book four, this was an analogy for how how leaders of the state should be. They should be like the free doctor, you know, who actually listens to people, um, who gains their consent, who learns from the people, and then, you know, tries to give reasons and explain and instruct people um, in what they should do going forward and tries to coax them into cooperation rather than just as opposed to the fake slave doctor who just like sort of dictates things with self-confidence of a dictator. So I think this is a really telling passage <laughs> and um, and it you know relates to what Michael just read because Plato brings up this contrast again. So he says in the passage that Michael just read that this doctor, this real doctor, will engage in a discussion about the source of the disease and he's tutoring the citizens. So this is my own observation about this now. I'll just make this one point and I'll save stuff for later. I see there's other hands up. So everything Michael has said so far is making me think of something I've noticed from my own reading of the laws thus far, uh, my first reading of the laws, which is that throughout, although it's not flagged as an explicit theme of the laws, I've noticed that throughout there's actually a kind of duality 
in this text. So there are these preambles that Michael is talking about, which is, as he says, like the spirit of the laws is like the underlying reason or the rationale for them. And they're presented in sometimes even like sort of mythic ways. And I'm assuming there are, there are ways to persuade the actual people of the state. And then there's, you know, as Michael points out, the actual <laughs> law per se, which can sound quite rigid and strict. So I've noticed this duality throughout because I, I remember recall in book six, something I found really interesting was that it was discussing like justice and the soul again. And it presented a religious approach, which is about these like high principles and about the objectivity of the good and just. And then he contrasts that with a secular view, which at first I thought it was like seemed totally contradictory because the secular view was, you know, is more about pain and pleasure and people acting according to pain and pleasure. I was like, how does this relate to the religious view that was presented? But I think this duality is about actually what he has gotten more explicit about in the, in, in the current book we're reading, which is that there are people who are maybe, um, I don't know what the word should be like higher thinkers, or they're like more attuned to the good, or they're more sensitive to it, or they're more motivated by it. And so that's who the preambles are for. But he becomes quite explicit in the current book. So we see more of this later on. Near the end of book nine, he talks about persons who are persuaded by words of exhortation who will give us no trouble, but stubborn people who ignore the preamble ought to be ready to take more notice of the following regulations, which are the actual laws. And he also says here, some laws, it seems, are made for the benefit of honest men to teach them the rules of association that have to be observed if they are to live in friendship. Others are made for those who refuse to be instructed and whose naturally tough natures have not been softened enough to stop them turning to absolute vice. And he says they need some more extreme deterrence. Yeah, so I guess that's that's just my like thought about this, which is that it's pointing to a kind of duality in the text between the presentation of the laws has to serve almost like two kinds of people like people who are more motivated by just like their selfish intentions so you have these laws which have these extreme deterrents and then there are people who can maybe listen to the reason more or closer to reason and the form the good or whatever <laughs> or wow. the good and so you know that's who the preambles and other other sections of the laws are for. But right. th these two parts can seem in conflict sometimes, but I think it makes sense if we understand in the background, Plato thinks there's these two kinds of people in the state. Yeah, good. Um, that's a really insightful reading. Um, and thank you for pointing out that passage in book four. I'd actually forgotten about that. So I might, uh, after our meeting today, go back and, and slip that back into the handout for posterity. <laughs> That's a good connection. But this duality that you're describing, I I mean, I think it's a little strong to call it two kinds of people. I think it's more that there are two audiences here. And this is not just unique to the laws. This is Pl Plato's whole challenge, which is, on the one hand, he's speaking to budding young philosophers in the academy. But on the other hand, he's articulating principles of the good that are supposed to be for all people. And that's especially true when you're writing a political framework. So the challenge here is, on the one hand, he's speaking to Clinius and Megillus, who are you know, his co-legislators. And they're also thinking of other people who are going to co-legislate with them in the construction of Magnesia. And also thinking of the rest of the body politic that's going to make up the citizenry and getting them on board. So there's sort of like, there has to be this kind of inner circle to get the thing going. And you're right, there is a sense in which there's a kind of inside language for the people who already understand what it means to legislate under the form of the good. But there has to be this outward focus to get the rest of the society to buy into the system so that it is a society governed by reason and not simply by coercion, which is a point 
that's made over and over and over that we don't want this to be a society where people just do things because they're told to, but rather they do them because their reason has responded to good exhortation. So I don't know if that's a necessarily a disagreement, Darren. I think that was me trying to reframe the duality that you're talking about. Um, and I think that's sort of a perpetual duality that we face even in contemporary societies where you know, we have these things we call elections that appeal to the electorate when the reality is only a very, very small subset of the society is actually sufficiently informed and engaged enough to speak directly on, on the issues. I think that's a similar duality to the one that the Athenian is wrestling with here. I'll just say just very quickly that I agree with what you're saying as it applies to, I think, the people who do act more according to reason. My sense is that there is, as we maybe see later in this book, or in book nine, I mean, that there does just seem like he thinks that there is a group of people, you know, who just are very, very stubborn or who just can't listen to reason and they need the really strict law. So I, I think right. there, the, is, the there is that bit. Yeah, that's yeah. the really tough eggs. Yeah. But for the <laughs> sure, other people, I think you are describing something correct about a lot of the other people. Like other people do have this duality. No one's pure reason, right? So there is a duality within those people too. But then there also seems to be two kinds of people as well. So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. You know, I picked this passage in part because I just love this line so much because I think we all have met or even some of us might be ourselves people we would describe as tough eggs, where the dialogue becomes intractable because there's just this wall that we can't seem to get past with the other person. And so I appreciate the kind of realism that's here that because of the diversity of humans, we can't go in, again, assuming that everybody's going to be perfectly rational and all respond to perfect rhetoric and exhortation and so forth, because that's just not what humans are like. Um, Fred. There's a recognition here in the, the second reading, 858B and forward, that they're serving an, an advisory role here and they're 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 really constructing an ideal set of laws almost de novo as if it was a brand new nation and they have the great luxury of doing that and they say for example in b uh, we work at our convenience and spend part of the time preparing our material part of the time fitting it together so they're under no pressure they're creating an ideal set of laws now in practice Governance is really more like uh, the ship of Theseus, you know, where it sets out the sea for a long time and parts of it rot and fall apart and they have to cobble together stopgap solutions as they go to stay afloat. Very imperfect process. And they're constrained in every which way to come up with these, this compromise uh, set of laws. Now, this would be useful. It would be useful today. And, and those of you who are, are or know about how it works in England, for example, it seems to me, I may be wrong in this, you correct me, that uh, they have or they used to have shadow governments where laws are enacted and the party out of power would say, well, this is what we would do if we were in power. And I think it, that's kind of a nice idea. And we should probably have uh, really one or more shadow governments. Okay, let's let's set aside all the constraints of interest groups and patching together on top of laws that we have now. Let's just start with, say, the Constitution. And let's try to make our laws constitutional. But other than that, let's let's pretend we're starting from a clean slate. If so, this is what we would do. Now, we wouldn't enact those laws, but nevertheless, it would serve as a useful advisory role saying, let's, yeah, let's, let's think about this idealization and then try to adapt it to, to our civilization. That's, that's dreaming, I suppose, but nevertheless, that's kind of cool to, to be able to do that. That's all. Thanks. Thanks. 
Oh, I, I commend Fred's comments to everyone. Those were so spot on and uh, really appreciating, I think, uh, the flavor of how the second passage concludes. Um, I typically don't draw attention to the footnotes that I put in these handouts. They're there for people to read for your own edification. But since I have a footnote here that's pretty resonant with what you were suggesting, Fred, I just want to kind of read this quickly. Um, at the end of this passage that you were just commenting on, I wrote, the contribution of idealism to politics is precisely this, the freedom to construct political solutions without the pressure of meeting budget deadlines, facing elections, or the threat of war. Of course, not all legislative work can be done so unbounded, but neither should it be all real politic compromises either. The daily grind of politics should be guided by the proposals of idealists to ensure society is aiming at the common good and not merely its survival. Idealist legislation is to daily legislation much like the preambles are to the written laws. And I think I was thinking of something similar to what you're suggesting, Fred, with your wonderful idea of the shadow government, that if all lawmaking is simply daily compromises between the balancing of interests competing with each other, it's very hard to see how that's going to approximate any kind of norm or ideal of goodness or justice in a society. And so you need kind of something that just abstracts away all of that pressure that leads to corruption, compromises, and so forth. And I think that is what's being modeled in the kinds of dialogues that Plato seems to like to write, where he does imagine, as you say, these de novo constructions precisely because it allows characters who have no on the ground interests to try to say, but what should the ideal be? What are we trying to do in the construction of this society? Can daily legislatures function that way or daily parliaments? No. No, there's no way this could be done on a daily basis in Parliament. But what we need is a kind of balancing between the two where they're mutually informing each other and it's not just one extreme or the other. So again, I love your comments, Fred, and I hope everybody else took notes. Uh, Fei Wu. Um, hello. So I'd like to comment on the doctor and the laws. So I live in the UK. We have a national health um, NHS services here. It's free for everyone. But uh, this system is designed to produce fake doctors because each session, because it's entirely free and uh, lots of people have given up their agency to look after their own health and uh, they just rely on the NHS instead because it's free, it's there. If they have problems, they can just go to doctors. They don't need to exercise. They can become idle and uh, obese, like we read last week, especially those uh, with lower or middle income people, people in lower socioeconomic classes. They have less agencies. They just give up their individual responsibility of look after their own health. This reflects a very bad law promised by certain populist politicians to use democracy to buy votes, uh, handouts and uh, favors. Unfortunately, once you give the populace something, you can never take it back. So now, no matter how much the NHS is costing and which is always increasing and uh, no politicians dare to touch it even though it's a very unjust law because it doesn't make people more virtuous or less evil. I strongly oppose free health care or I think 80-20 uh, approach would be better. The government contribute 80% of the cost and the individuals contribute 20%. That's my thinking. And another point I want to comment on was that law 
should be designed to make people more virtuous or less evil. Uh, I'm a proponent of stringent laws. Singapore, they have stringent laws and they are the safest state and also the cleanest state in the whole world called the Garden City. I hear in New York, some parts of New York and California, some uh, liberal mayors or governors get in, they lose punishments, and then crime runs rampant. And lots of people are exiting those states. And now those states are considering some exit tax, which is grossly unfair and unproductive. And it will only lead to its own destruction. And I think some laws, once it's there, it becomes uh, our second nature, such as wearing a seat belt. And uh, it does uh, only good and no harm. So I'm a strong opponent of liberal ideologies. Thank you. Thanks, Fei Wu, for your comments. A very, very interesting perspective, um, one I did not anticipate today. Um, so I think I'm not sure I've understood you right. So let me let me see if I can think out loud for a second. It sounds like what you're resonating with with respect to Plato is you appreciate his anti-liberalism in the sense of he does think virtue should be the aim of a society so he doesn't believe in a value neutral government or something like that but yes. i think you're what does the value neutral mean uh and that's a good question i i think liberal democratic societies tend to think of themselves as they're not taking a position on what constitutes virtue or the good, and therefore they don't try to encourage citizens towards a particular conception of virtue. And it sounds like you are much more interested in legislation that does try to encourage people towards a conception of virtue or the good. Yeah. And your comment about the healthcare, I, I think what you're getting at is you have a suspicion of nonetheless a certain sort of paternalism that reduces this sense of individual responsibility for the populace. And you know, that's an that's a really interesting question to raise because there is no doubt that Plato's dialogue here, that the Athenian Clinius and McGillis are sort of co-constructing, that they are envisioning a paternalistic state of a sort. But I do think what your comment brings out is that um, they're not envisioning a state where individual responsibility sort of falls away and the state just becomes this kind of nanny that brings you along and you can just sort of exist and you don't have there's nothing to aspire to but it's it's much more like the state is responsible for the individuals and the individuals are responsible for the state so there's this mutual high degree of responsibility that's expected over and over and over again and i'm i'm just curious to sort of as we continue our conversation today i wonder if that's a sufficiently distinct enough form of paternalism from the types of worries that you are raising or if it's still similar. I I do think Plato's Athenian here would probably support some form of shared health care, but I think he would definitely agree with you. It shouldn't be the kind of shared health care where it results in people who don't care about their own health because that sort of defeats the purpose of health care. Well, I'm still for paternalism. That's why right. I think the state support 80% of the health care, which is the majority. That's very paternal. But you want and some individual investment. And only contribute to 20% of the cost, mm -hmm. which also gives the more disciplined individuals incentives to seek private health care when needed, etc. 
reduce the burden of both the state and the individuals, make people more virtuous and less right. evil. No, that's very interesting. And uh, if only Plato had lived a little bit longer to start thinking about concrete proposals like that. Um, so I'm going to go to James now, and just in the interest of time, um, we'll have James's comment be the last one for our first theme, and then I'll move to read the second theme, because it's a little bit lengthy, so I want to make sure we get it out in front of us here um, as soon as we can. So go ahead, James. Thanks. I, I just wanted to say, and I don't, I, I would rather not get into a discussion about current laws and the current state of government, but, you know, to tie it back to what Plato is saying and i think there's a theme here about the common good that needs to be considered in the context of modern laws as well as ancient laws and you know so not to engender a debate with Fai Wu, but i live in a country where there is free health care in canada uh, my mother died of cancer and i would rather not have paid 20 percent of the cost of her health care for something that was not her fault so I think we can come up with these rules, and it really makes me think of, uh, you know, how do we come up with the rules? And I think this is what Clinius is saying here. You know, we need the material for the foundation of the rules, and we can't just kind of pull themes out of, you know, one person's views versus another person's views. There has to be some thing that relates to a common good. And I would just call attention to, because, you know, Darren brought up the great part about the doctor, and the distinction between the doctor that prescribes but doesn't instruct versus the doctor that instructs. And so I just wanted to read this very short part. It's at 859a. The Athenian says, then is it really more scandalous in the case of Homer and Tertius and the other poets to have composed and writing bad rules for the conduct of life, but less so for Lycurgus and Solon and all the others who have turned legislator and committed their recommendations to writing? The proper view, surely, is this. A city's writings on legal topics should turn out, on being opened, to be the finest and the best of all those it has in circulation. The writings of other men should be either sound in harmony with them or provoke ridicule by being out of tune. So what is the style to which a state's laws ought to be written, in our opinion? Should the regulations appear in the light of a loving and prudent father and mother? Or should they act the tyrant and the despot, posting their orders and threats on walls and leaving it at that? And I think that's really in the sense of the common good is to do that instruction role because no legislator is perfect. And I think in that conversation, things will come up about the natural order of laws. And I think, again, it's this man is the measure of all things theme that Plato just consistently rebuts. And I think this is one of those cases where, uh, you know, nobody is endowed with the absolute right to understand what the correct laws are. But we have to go back to the first principles of the laws, which in Book 10 is reason itself. No one of us is endowed with the capacity to understand reason itself. And so we need this instruction to instruct the lawmakers as much as the citizens, I think. So I think that's the key. And I just wanted to read that part because it really struck me as the law should not dictate to us. I think that's, that's the key. They should instruct but not dictate. So thank you. Which is a, a nice way of saying that... Contrary to some um, popular slanders, uh, Plato's dialogues are not advocating for a totalitarian regime, <laughs> but for a persuasive regime where, again, to, to use this doctor analogy that we've been referring back to several times, we're looking for those who practice the medicine of politics according to good reasons and not simply by what works by appearances. And I think that's the real distinction between the two types of doctors in the passage that we read. Um, one type of doctor sort of has found these rules of thumb, like, you know, this gets the job done and so forth. And the other is like, no, what is the actual cause of the disease? And what does reason suggest would be the right way to actually cure the disease and not just get by? And so he's saying we should have society governed by people who really understand the nature of human relations, and I would add their relationship to their environment as well, and govern on that basis and not just on the basis of balancing interests, where, where man is the measure of all things. <laughs>
Okay, now I'm going to transition us to our second theme. I titled this, Can All Unjust Acts Be Reconciled? And I chose that as a topic because this is where we're going to sort of tackle head on one of the most challenging parts of book nine, which is the invocation of the death penalty. So we're gonna look at sort of the underlying theory behind the recommendations here. And I, I again wanna say that the, our focus is not gonna be so much on the particular letter of the law. My guess is they're probably not laws that we would write at least in this way today. But I do want us to think very deeply about the discussion that sort of stands behind these laws and the types of principles that I think the Athenian is aiming at here. Now I have the first reading here is a very short selection. It's just that short paragraph you see on the top of page six. Then I have an excerpt from the Phaedo that I think is essential to understanding this. So I want us to have that in the background. And then I have a much longer passage from later in book nine. So I wanna read all three of those in one go here so that we get the full amount of the text in front of us. And I will pause before the third and final reading for theme two, just because there's so much text, I wanna make sure we're not biting off too much at once. So give me a chance here to just kind of read us through these three excerpts and then I'll open it up again for discussion. Again, I encourage you to take notes along the way so that you don't forget your questions. So this first short excerpt comes from 854E to 855A, and it starts with one of the actual laws. Those of you looking at the handout, you can see I've indented it to note that this is an actual law. And the law is, if a citizen is ever shown to be responsible for such a crime, these are the heinous acts I referred to in my introduction, that is to have perpetuated some great and unspeakable offense against the gods or his parents or the state, the penalty is death. So that's the statement of the law. And then we get this short comment on that law. The judge should consider him, uh, that is the wrongdoer, as already beyond cure. He should bear in mind the kind of education and upbringing the man has enjoyed from his earliest years and how after all this, he has still not abstained from acts of the greatest evil. But the very tiniest of evils will be what the offender suffers. Indeed, he will be of service to others by being a lesson to them when he is ignominiously banished from sight beyond the borders of the state. And if the children and family escape taking on the character of the father, they should be held in honor and win golden opinions for the spirit and persistence by which they have shunned evil and embraced the good. So that's our first reading. And it's very suggestive, but I don't think it gives us the full picture of what the Athenian has in mind for that we will need these next two sections. So the next section I'm gonna read here is from the Phaedo. This is where Socrates is preparing to drink the hemlock. And in the course of that discussion, he describes some details of the afterlife. And I just think that what happens here is really sort of the bedrock higher principles that's underwriting some of the discussion here. So I'm gonna read this and I'm, I'll say right now, I can't pronounce all of these Greek words. So some of these are going to be mispronunciations. Such is the nature of these things, Socrates says. When the dead arrive at the place to which each has been led by his guardian spirit, they are first judged as to whether they have led a good and pious life. Those who have lived an average life make their way to the Archeon and embark upon such vessels as there are for them and proceed to the lake. There they dwell and are purified by penalties for any wrongdoing they may have committed. They are also suitably rewarded for their good deeds as each deserves. Those who are deemed incurable because of the enormity of their crimes have committed many such great sacrileges or wicked and unlawful murders and other such wrongs. Their fitting fate is to be hurled into Tartarus never to emerge from it. Those who are deemed to have committed great but curable crimes such as doing violence to their father or mother in a fit of temper, but who have felt remorse for the rest of their lives, or who have killed someone in a similar manner, 
These must of necessity be thrown into Tartarus. But a year later, the current throws them out. Those who are guilty of murder by way of the coctus and those who have done violence to their parents by way of the paraphilegianthon, that's almost certainly not the right pronunciation, after they have been carried along the Archicurusian lake, they cry out and shout, some for those they have killed, others for those they have maltreated, and calling them, they then pray to them and beg them to allow them to step out into the lake and to receive them. If they persuade them, they do step out and their punishment comes to an end. If they do not, they are taken back to Tartarus and from there to the rivers, and this does not stop until they have persuaded those they have wronged. For this is the punishment which the judges imposed on them. And um, before I go on to the, the last reading I'm going to do here, I just want to say what's really, I think, remarkable about this passage is the theme you should draw from this is, as I put at the top, the vicious soul should be cured wherever possible. There is a strong overriding sense here that the goal, the primary goal of the afterlife is purgation. That is to purge people of their viciousness so that they can be reconciled to those they have wronged. The amount of emphasis in this reading on reconciliation, I think, is just astonishing the only exception is those who cannot be cured. That is those for whom no amount of purgation will be sufficient. Now, whether or not we think that's true in eternity or whatever, there's going to be a parallel of this, I think, in the readings that we're discussing with respect to an earthly life of what earthly measures can do to purge an earthly soul. So to start that discussion, I'm now going to go to our third and final reading for now, and then we'll pause for discussion. This is a little bit long, so give me some patience here, but this is 859C to 862B. And in this section, the Athenian brings up some really timeless topics. These are themes that are still discussed to this day in legal studies and in the philosophy of law. So this is really, really important and insightful discussion. The Athenian begins, in the first place, we must continue the attempt we've just made. We must scrutinize our law about robbers of temples, theft in general, and every variety of crime. We should not let it daunt us if, in the full spate of our legislation, we find that although we have settled some matters, our inquiry into others has still to be completed. We are still aiming at the status of legislators, but we haven't achieved it yet. Perhaps eventually we may succeed. So now let's look at these topics I've mentioned, if, that is, you are prepared to look at them in the way I have explained. Clinius says, certainly, we are prepared. The Athenian continues, now, on the whole subject of goodness and justice, we ought to try to see quite clearly just where we agree and where there are differences of opinion between us. Again, how far do ordinary men agree? What differences are there between them? Naturally, we should claim that we wanted there to be at least a small difference between us and ordinary men. What sort of differences between us have you in mind when you say that? I'll try to explain. When we talk about justice in general, just men, just actions, just arrangements, we are, after a fashion, unanimous that all these things are good. One might insist that even if just men happen to be shocking in their physical appearance, they are still preeminently good because of their supremely just character. No one would think a man was talking nonsense and saying that. Wouldn't that be right, Clinius asks? Perhaps. But if everything that has the quality of justice is good, we ought to note that we include in that everything, even the things done to us which are about as frequent, roughly speaking, as the things we do to others. What now, then? Any just action we do has the quality of being good, roughly in proportion to the degree to which it has the quality of justice. Indeed. So surely anything done to us, which has the quality of justice, is to that extent agreed to be good. This wouldn't involve our argument in any contradiction true. If we agree that something done to us is just, but at the same time shocking, 
The terms just and good will be in conflict with each other. The reason being that we have termed just actions most shameful. Clinia says, uh, what are you getting at? The Athenian says, it's not difficult to understand. The injunctions of the laws we laid down a little while ago would seem to be in flat contradiction to what we are saying now. How so? Our ruling was, I think, that the temple robber and the enemy of properly established laws would suffer a just death. But then, on the brink of establishing a great many such rules, we held back. We saw ourselves becoming involved with penal suffering of infinite variety and on grand scale. Of all sufferings, these were particularly just, but they were also the particularly shocking ones. Thus, surely one minute we find just and good invariably turning out to be the same, and the next moment discover they are opposites. Okay, likely enough, Glenia says. This is the source of the inconsistency in the language of the ordinary man. He destroys the unity of the terms good and just. Clinius says, that is indeed how it looks, sir. Now, Clinius, we ought to examine our own position again. How far is it consistent in this business? Consistent? <laughs> what consistency do you mean? The Athenian says, earlier in our discussion, I think I have said quite categorically, or if I haven't before, assume I'm saying it now, that, that what? That all wicked men are, in all respects, unwillingly wicked. This being so, my next argument necessarily follows. What argument? Clinius asks. The Athenian says that the unjust man is doubtless wicked, but that the wicked man is in that state only against his will. However, to suppose that a voluntary act is performed involuntarily makes no sense. Therefore, in the eyes of someone who holds the view that injustice is involuntary, a man who acts unjustly would seem to be doing so against his will. Here and now, that is the position I have to accept. I allow that no one acts unjustly except against his will. If anyone with a disputatious disposition or a desire to attract favorable notice says that although there are those who are unjust against their will, even so many men do commit unjust acts voluntarily, I would reject his argument and stick to what I said. Well then, how am I to make my own arguments consistent? Suppose the two of you, Clinius and McGillis, were to ask me, if that's so, sir, what advice have you for us about laying down the laws for the city of the Magnesians? Do we legislate or don't we? Of course we legislate, I say, and you'd ask, are you going to make a distinction for the Magnesians between voluntary and involuntary acts of injustice? Shall we impose stiffer penal ties on voluntary wrongdoing and acts of injustice and smaller penalties on the involuntary? Or shall we treat them all on an equal footing on the grounds that there simply is no such thing as an act of voluntary injustice? Clinia says, you're perfectly right, sir. So, what use shall we make of this position that we have just taken up? That's a good question. First of all, we shall make this use of it. What? Let's cast our minds back. A few minutes ago, we were quite right to say that in the matter of justice, we were in a state of great muddle and inconsistency. With that in mind, we may go back to asking questions of ourselves. We have not yet found a way out of our confusion in these things. We have not defined the difference between these two categories of wrongs, voluntary and involuntary. In all states, every lawgiver who has ever appeared treats them as distinct, and the distinction is reflected in his laws. Now, is the position we took up a moment ago to overrule all dissent, like a decision handed down from God? Shall we make just this one assertion? and dismiss the topic without adducing any reasons to show that our position is correct? Impossible. What we must do, before we legislate, is somehow make clear that there are two categories, but that the distinction between them is a different one. Then, when one imposes the penalty on either, everybody will be able to appreciate the arguments for it, and make some kind of judgment 
whether it is the appropriate penalty to have imposed or not. Clinius says, we think you've stated the position fairly, sir. We must do one of two things, either stop insisting that unjust acts are always involuntary or before going any further, demonstrate its validity by means of a preliminary distinction. The Athenian says, the first of the two alternatives, denying the proposition when I believe it to represent the truth, is absolutely unacceptable to me. I should be breaking the laws of both God and man. But if the two things do not differ by virtue of being voluntary and involuntary, how do they differ? What other factor is involved? That is what we have to try somehow or other to show. It is surely impossible, sir, to approach the problem in any other way, Clinius says. So this is what we shall try to do. Look, when citizens come together and associate with each other, they obviously inflict many injuries. And to these, the terms voluntary and involuntary can be freely applied. Of course, Clinius says. But, the Athenian goes on, no one should describe all these injuries as acts of injustice and conclude that, therefore, the unjust acts committed in these cases of injury fall into two categories. Involuntary, because if we add them all up, you see, involuntary injuries are no less numerous and no less great than the voluntary ones, and voluntary as well. Rather than do that, consider the next step I'm going to take in my argument. Am I on to something or just driveling? My position, Clinius and Megillus, is not that if someone hurts someone else involuntarily and without intending it, he is acting unjustly but involuntarily. I will not legislate so as to make this an involuntary act of injustice. Ignoring its relative seriousness or triviality, I shall refuse to put down such an injury under the heading of injustice at all. Indeed, if my view is sustained, we shall often say of a benefactor that he is committing the injustice of conferring a benefit, an improper benefit. You see, my friends, in effect, we should not simply call it just when one man bestows some object on another, nor simply unjust when correspondingly he takes it from him. The description just is applicable only to the benefit conferred or injury inflicted by someone with a just character and outlook. Now I'm going to pause there. The passage actually does continue. We have one more reading for this theme, but I, I want to pause there before we see how this passage resolves itself, because I want to make sure we've sufficiently wrestled through this question of the curable versus the incurable and this question of the voluntary versus the involuntary first, before we then go and look at how the Athenian is going to try to combine all of these concepts together for a rationale for the death penalty. So let me pause there and let's see what kind of reactions people have to some of the questions that have been raised, some of the distinctions that have been made. And just to be clear, I want everyone to realize that the distinctions being drawn here are present in our modern legal codes today. We tend to make, for example, the distinction between manslaughter and murder, where manslaughter sort of evinces the kind of, um, you know, you, you did the deed, but it was in a fit of passion, or you did it accidentally, or through negligence, or something like that, whereas murder is something that you intended or you premeditated or something like that. And that's roughly the kind of voluntary versus involuntary distinction that the Athenian is here criticizing. So he thinks that distinction can't actually hold. Why? Because of the very well-known, very famous platonic principle that nobody ever willingly does evil deeds. And we can also talk about that principle as well. So I'll open it up for questions or comments on the passages thus far. Go ahead and start us off, James. Yeah, thanks for reading that uh, section from the Phaedo. It, it was really eye-opening to recall that because 
I think what it's saying is that the soul is not naturally corrupted. It becomes corrupted over time, but you know, the universe itself, having a soul, the universe itself is not corrupted. Um, so I think the the fundamental nature of the soul is not corrupted, but it becomes corrupted over time. And that really highlights the fact that over many iterations of the soul, many embodiments of the soul, there's that chance for, uh, you know, I guess, redemption. But, you know, the, it, it, clearly it's saying that the soul has a memory, even after the body dies, right? So the soul continues on. And I think maybe one of the key things is that this idea of will, uh, like whether one can commit evils willingly, is an interesting one because maybe will there ties to reason. Like if one commits an evil, uh, what reason does one have to commit an evil? Well, I think it's hard to conjure a reason for committing evil. And so maybe that's the idea of not willingly committing an evil. So yeah, th those were really interesting connections. And then I think the other thing that I wanted to just highlight, and I don't think it's in the reading, but it comes shortly after this section at 864a, where the Athenian says, may I now clearly distinguish for you without elaboration what, in my view, the terms just and unjust mean. My general description of injustice is this, the mastery of the soul by anger, fear, pleasure, pain, envy, and desires, whether they lead to any actual damage or not. And I think that really highlights that it's our job to rein in those things using reason. And if we don't, then we confer these improper benefits, which is what he's saying in this section, which is really the nature of the injustice is the conferring of those improper benefits. Uh, and I think that conferring comes about because one is guided by these emotions rather than by reason. Uh, and that's where the injustice arises. And, and I liked his description of injustice at 864a. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you reading that, James. Simply for space and length of the podcast, I didn't include everything, but as everyone's pointing out, you know, book nine is very pregnant with these rich ideas. And I think what um, you're helping us to see is that the proposal here is that whether or not something is just or unjust has to do with character, not with deed. And so the way I read this distinction here is that if an injury is done involuntarily, that's another way of saying it was done accidentally. Like you weren't trying to do it. You did hurt somebody, but there was no sense in which your character was the cause of what happened. Whereas if you bring your character into something, if your character is the cause, then it, it either flows from a just character or an unjust character. But he wants to say, in either case, you can't understand somebody to be willing justice or willing injustice because the latter category is going to be incoherent. You can't sit here and say, I'm going to do something that is going to make the state of things worse than they are. Because as you said, we couldn't possibly give a reason for doing that. Now, this is a controversial thesis, and I think it'd be interesting to hear from others whether or not you think that kind of absurdity is possible or not. Um, this is something that later thinkers really wrestled with quite a bit about the irrationality of evil. Nonetheless, could our desires be so perverted that there is a sense in which we crave the evil, or is that just you know, and that, that's, that actually is a reason. And we do think it's a good, we're just confused about what is the good, which is Plato's thesis. So this is a very naughty problem. I don't want people to assume it's an uncontroversial problem, but it's definitely a major perspective that is motivating a lot of the discussion here. Uh, Darren, help us out. Oh boy. It's a huge problem. And um, this is a, I mean, really big problem not just in like Plato scholarship, obviously, it's a big problem in ethics in general and just, I think, living. Because the way I understand it, when he says in the section where you read, uh, where he talks about there's an inconsistency in the language of the ordinary man, he destroys the unity of the terms good and just, the terms in which I understand it. I think this is one of the ways in which you can understand it. 
is a perennial problem in just like living life is why should we do the just thing or the moral thing? And the reason why that's a struggle is because sometimes it seems like doing what we understand to be the just or the right thing seems to cost us in some ways in terms of pleasure, in terms of maybe we become unpopular in a group, in terms of, um, you know, whatever else, money or whatever, you know. <laughs> mm. So this is why he says the ordinary man thinks that, you know, the good and just can be contradictory. And of course, I mean, just this problem of the unity of goodness and justice, I mean, it was really brought to a very sharp point in, you know, I keep coming back to book one of the Republic, but I think, I mean, I think a lot comes back to book one of the Republic, you know, where Socrates says he'd rather be tortured in the most gruesome ways, but still being just and avoiding injustice rather than, you know, the tyrant who has, you know, all the pleasures he wants, but is unjust, you know, he'll rather be the person being tortured. And of course, like everyone, I'm assuming even, you know, readers today would be like, why would anyone want that? Because although justice is a good thing, and you know, it would be good for Socrates to be just, but he's being tortured. That doesn't seem good at all. So like, why should a person sacrifice themselves in that way and do the right thing? And I think there's interesting stuff going on here regarding his solution to this here especially when luck comes into it. I don't want to go down. Maybe maybe we'll, we can come back to this later. Like that would be another very long comment for me. Sorry. So like, I, I think there's interesting stuff about the luck thing. I think Plato has a very novel solution to the problem of moral luck that I have actually not thought of before. <laughs> but um, I just want to stick to the, like just the framing of the problem here. So I think there's something happening here that's similar to our previous discussion in book six. And I think it's important for the state, for people to understand that justice and goodness are both objective things. Like there's always the temptation to think that all that concept amounts to is like what's good for me or good for one person. So what's good for you is separate from like what's good for me and good for that person. Like good just means good for something or someone, <laughs> uh, such as their well-being or what, however you flesh that out. Whereas what Plato, I think, is trying to get us attuned to is that there is just good period like what is good for you is also good for me because it is the good <laughs> there's just the thing called the good ethics doesn't boil down to just my happiness or my eudaimonia or whatever there is just something just the good <laughs> whether you agree with them or not so i just want to bring us back to this um some of the discussion on book six sorry i've been going a long time but, or sorry book five which um really um highlighted this so we talked about what does a good soul look like and he talks about how he doesn't just admire like just actions when they're his own, as if they're his own possessions, but he, he admires acts of justice, period. Like even when they're done by something else, it's not about just you being good or whatever. And that makes you an honorable person, you know, and it doesn't matter what other people are. The good soul admires acts of justice, period. He also talks about how, in fact, the good soul, I remember we discussing this, would make more of our friend's services to you than your own acts of goodness to others. So he says here, and so for friends and companions, you will find them easier to get on with in day-to-day -day contact if you make more of their services to you and esteem them more highly than they do and put a smaller value on your own good turns to your friends and companions than they do themselves. My thought in when reading that section was the same as what you just read for us, Michael. There's this general problem of like, what is good and what should we aim for in ethics? Is it just good for oneself? So your good for yourself is different from mine? No, it's like for Plato, he's, he's using all these arguments, both in book five and now book nine, to get us to sense that good is like something objective and that, that's shared. This is actually a kind of new move in ancient ethics. There's a tendency in ancient ethics to, and this is a criticism, a kind of criticism of ancient ethics, that it's actually kind of self-absorbed. <laughs> it's all about you and the person and your happiness or relieving your suffering. But when Plato is introducing this idea of the good, it's like it moves ethics beyond just a kind of self-absorption with like your eudaimonia, your happiness or whatever, to just your good being also my good. And I, I don't think it's an accident that it's coming to the fore here in the laws, which is about a good community, a good state. Um, I do have thoughts about the particular solution, but I'll just leave it there. I'm going a long time yeah. already. Sorry. Yeah, appreciate it. Those are great comments, Darren. I 
I think I'm going to let them stand just because you've you're right in the meat of this discussion and just let Fred jump in and keep it going. So go ahead, Fred. Yeah, that's a good point, Darren. And I think it points to the development of a kind of unicity of, of the good in Greek philosophy, uh, where Plato is hinting, or maybe more than hinting, at the consistency between the good for the individual and the good for the, the populace as a whole. And I think that's developed further where it comes not just consistent, but identical, and probably reaches its culmination in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, where there's a simple identification of the good for the individual and the, the good for the state. Uh, that seems peculiarly Greek. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody would hold that position today uh, in any culture, really, but I'm probably wrong there. And it, it also raises a question in this reading of, should we discriminate between the individual motives in parceling out uh, punishments for infractions? That's always a problem <clears throat> with uh, legislation and in particular judicial theory, that the theory is, at least in modern judicial practice, is that you punish the act, the deed, and not the, the, the motive. And that's primarily a practical motivation in that we cannot truly discern the motive of individuals and the virtue of, of individuals. They might be just the greatest person on earth as far as we can tell. But when it comes to punishing them for a deed which they committed, we cannot pierce beyond the veil of what they appear to us to discern their true motives and their true virtue However, we have an escape patch here in uh, modern judicial theory, and that is that we temper justice with mercy, that we do take into account a person's behavior and their character based on the testimony of others. So judges have some discretion. So that's kind of an escape patch. So officially, we always punish the deed and not the not the virtue, not based on the virtue of the individual. But then we, we have a little bit of leeway. And I think that's the right approach that has probably developed over centuries that allows for both. And this is just continues, the debate continues forever from this point about to what extent we punish based on the deed versus the behavior and motivation and virtue of the individual. Thanks. So great, Fred. I wanted to build on your comment. I wanted to go back to the very first little excerpt that I read here and just make sure people caught the intention here, which I think is in line with what you just said, that the death penalty is prescribed for those the judge considers beyond cure. But the second clause here is not a, a throwaway comment. It's actually exactly what you said. It's a mitigating factor. The judge should bear in mind the kind of education and upbringing the man has enjoyed from his earliest years and how after all this, he has not still abstained from acts of greatest evil. We have to be clear here. The Athenian is imagining a person who commits a heinous act in the wake of an upbringing in the virtuous educational system of Magnesia, meaning this is somebody who has been given every benefit and opportunity of the society to learn and practice virtue. That is the comment that's being made. And so the corollary of this is if you're not in Magnesia, you're not in a society that gives the benefit of a virtuous education from birth then that is not somebody who has enjoyed the kind of education that, that would lead to virtue. And therefore, that would be a major mitigating factor if they have not been benefited by this. So this judgment of being beyond cure is really only being pronounced on somebody who has first been given all the resources of the society to help them to become virtuous first. And then it's like, well, we did all we could, so it looks like there's nothing left to do. But if a society has not done all that they could, 
then absolutely um, there should be a merciful dimension. And we're going to see that in the next reading, in fact, that that, that will get evoked in certain ways. Um, Fei Wu, and then maybe after Fei Wu's comment, I'll go ahead and then read that last reading under the theme so we can see how the Athenian works all of this out. So go ahead, Fei Wu. I want to address uh, the objective good brought up by Darren. I think it does exist. And what what's truly good for individual will also be beneficial to others and the society as a whole. When I say truly, uh, I'll use NHS as an example again. I think this uh, 8020 approach uh, the state is responsible for 80% of the cost and the individual responsible for 20% of the cost will really benefit everyone and the state as a whole. It's because individuals, just consider if electricity is free, our consumption will definitely grossly increase because we'll then not pay attention to conserve it. The same applies to healthcare because healthcare is much more expensive and complex than electricity consumption. And uh, also I am pro paternity that uh, I think the just state will look after the basic safety, including health of the individuals. So I am for the state being responsible for 80% of the cost. Because first, the use of NHS services will grossly decrease. That lessens the burden of the NHS. And then, as a result, the NHS can provide better quality of services to patients. So they will not just give each session just 10 minutes and then a quick diagnosis and without explaining the cause, without the doctor adopting a different approach, like to talk to the patient to understand how they got the illness, which benefits both the patient and the doctor. So the quality of the service will increase substantially. And uh, of course, by being more responsible to our own health, we become stronger, we, we exercise more, we eat more healthy, we become less idle, and uh, it strengthens our spirit because when our physical body is strengthened mentally, we will be strengthened as well. It benefits everyone. And, uh, right. and uh, this is the objective good. Yeah, Fei Wu, I will, if we have time, I hope we will, um, the final selection I have for today, which comes after the one I'm about to read, is a short passage that addresses the way in which a society constructs itself to focus on this common objective good. Although I think you're, you know, rightly raising the question that there still is some debate to be had over what exactly it means to have a good that benefits everybody, in your example, the doctor and the patient alike. I don't want to get lost in a debate about the UK's DHS. I'm, I'm an American, so I don't know anything about <laughs> healthcare in the United Kingdom. But let's come back to some of your broader reflections um, when we get to the final reading, which talks about this goal of aiming at the common good. Um, the question of whether or not there is a just application for the common good of the death penalty. So we've seen a lot of the apparatus that's been set up here. Now the Athenian is going to try to close some of these different loops and show how they should be applied. So I want to kind of just kind of hear how people react. So at the top, for those of you looking on the handout, you can see I have a little kind of blurb summarizing this. And I wrote, the spirit of the law says that the death penalty can be imposed only as a final mercy for those for whom no other good can be given. And my phrasing there is somewhat of an adaptation from 
an excerpt you can find on the title page of your handout from C.S. Lewis, where he talks about if you have an incurable soul that is just sort of perpetuating evil indefinitely, that arresting that perpetuation of evil is a type of good for that soul. In other words, the soul, a soul committing evil is doing evil to itself, not just to other people. And so arresting that production of evil is itself a type of good. So drawing on C.S. Lewis's insight here, that's the lens through which I think we're going to best understand the Athenians' point in this passage, which is an immediate continuation of the previous reading. So the Athenian continues, this is the point the lawgiver has to watch. He must keep his eyes on these two things, injustice and injury. He must use the law to exact damages for damage done as far as he can. He must restore losses, and if anyone has knocked something over, put it back upright again. In place of anything killed or wounded, he must substitute something in a sound condition. And when atonement has been made by compensation, he must try by his laws to make the criminal and the victim, in each separate case of injury, friends instead of enemies. So far, so good, Clinius says. The Athenian says... Now to deal with unjust injuries and gains too, as when one man's unjust act results in a gain for someone else. The cases that are curable, we must cure on the assumption that the soul has been infected by disease. We must, however, state what general policy we pursue in our cure for injustice. What is this policy? This. When anyone commits an act of injustice, serious or trivial, the law will combine instruction and constraint so that in the future, either the criminal will never again dare to commit such a crime voluntarily, or he will do it a very great deal less often. And in addition, he will pay compensation for the damage he has done. This is something we can achieve only by laws of the highest quality. We may take action or simply talk to the criminal. We may grant him pleasures or make him suffer. We may honor him. We may disgrace him. We can find him or give him gifts. We may use absolutely any means to make him hate injustice and embrace true justice, or at any rate, not hate it. But suppose the lawgiver finds a man who's beyond cure. What legal penalty will he provide for this case? He will recognize that the best thing for all such people is to cease to live, best even for themselves. By passing on, they will help others too. First, they will constitute a warning against injustice. And secondly, they will leave the state free of scoundrels. This is why the lawgiver should prescribe the death penalty in such cases by way of punishment for their crimes, but in no other case whatever. Calenius reacts to this. In one way, what you have said seems eminently reasonable. However, we should be glad to hear a clear explanation of two points. First, the difference between injustice and injury. And secondly, the various senses of voluntary and involuntary that you distinguish so elaborately in the course of your argument. The Athenian replies, I must try to meet your request and explain these points. Doubtless in the course of conversation, you make at least this point to each other about the soul. One of the constituent elements, whether part or state is not important, to be found in the soul is anger. And this innate impulse unruly and difficult to fight as it is, causes a great deal of havoc by its irrational force. Yes, indeed. The next point is the distinction we make between pleasure and anger. We say, pleasure wields her power on the basis of an opposite kind of force. She achieves whatever her will desires by persuasive deceit that is irresistibly compelling. Quite right. Thirdly, we would say nothing but the truth if we named ignorance as a cause of wrongdoing. The lawgiver would, in fact, do a better job if he divided ignorance into two. Simple ignorance, which he would treat as the cause of trivial faults, and double ignorance, 
which is the error of a man who is not only in the grip of ignorance, but on top of that is convinced of his own wisdom, believing that he has a thorough knowledge of matters, of which, in fact, his ignorance is total. And I will say, as an aside, this is Michael speaking, that that is probably the greatest problem we have today. <laughs> um, okay, back to Plato. When such ignorance is backed up by strength and power, the lawgiver will treat it as the source of serious and barbarous wrongdoing. But when it lacks power, and here's the mercy component, when it lacks power, he will treat the resultant faults as the peccadilios of children and old men. He will, of course, regard these deeds as offenses and will legislate against these people's offenders, but the laws will be of the most gentle character, full of understanding. So that ends the reading. And I just want to say quickly before we then dive into our discussion, so please use the raise hand function. This is the kind of mercy function that I think Fred was evoking earlier. And I just want to say, Plato is writing in a time in which assigning the death penalty because somebody insulted your family name was perfectly normal. Using extreme punishments for trivial matters was normal. So this would have been scandalous for Plato's audience to realize that he is actually limiting the cases of when the death penalty can be applied to a very narrow set. And then giving this kind of further analysis about motive, where he allows that we've got, you know, these different types of ignorance. And he says, it's only the ignorance where somebody is like, say, president of the United States and acts in ignorance. That's where the law needs to be severe. But when it's people who are just being foolish and they don't know better, there we need to enact a lot of mercy in our lawmaking. Um, again, have we learned something about what that kind of mercy can look like in the 2,400 years since Plato? Absolutely. But the fact that Plato is saying this at all in his context would be truly shocking. Uh, James, go ahead and dive in here. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I guess we're only a few minutes shy of the end of the, the scheduled end of the meeting. So if folks are willing to stay on for, say, another 15 minutes or so, it's an important discussion. So I think we would like to do that if we can. I wanted to say just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, in terms of people being put to death in that time, of course, the famous example, as you read from the Phaedo, is Socrates, who was put to death for a trumped up reason by a process that was not well regulated at all. And here in, uh, actually, it's not in today's reading, but at um, the beginning of book nine, 855b, there's a very strict process put in place for the meeting out of the death penalty. And we've already talked about the way that the guardians of the laws are elected through this process of nominations and weeding out objectionable people and all of that. So first of all, there's a very good process to elect the judges which is something that, you know, if we try to look at this with today's situation with the current lens, I think it becomes very difficult. But at 855D, he says that the vote in these matters should be taken openly. But before this, our judges should have ranged themselves according to seniority and sat down close together facing the prosecutor and defendant. All citizens who have some spare time should attend and listen carefully to such trials. And then there's a process where the prosecutor is allowed to speak, the defendant is allowed to speak, and they have to do it repeatedly four days in a row before they can arrive at a conclusion. So this is not this is not just some whim like the tyrants of Athens exercised against Socrates. It's a process that is well thought out and based on reason. Um, so I just wanted to call attention to that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is just that line about how it would actually better the soul of the person who is committing these heinous acts to not live anymore. And that reminds me of, uh, well, since Darren mentioned the beginning of the Republic, I'll mention the end of the Republic, the myth of Ur, where Ur dies in a battle, comes back to life and tells of his experience of this gathering of souls, like the soul never dies, right? So in, in Plato's cosmology, the soul just goes on, it's part of the universe. And 
the point that Ur made is that once you choose your lot in the next life, you can't go back and you may live to regret it. And this is why it's incumbent on the soul to learn in the current life so that the soul does not repeat the same mistakes in the next life. And I think that's very key to understand. So I just wanted to make those two points, but it's a very different view than if we just view the body and goodness and justice as just things that exist in time. The soul is something that exists timelessly. And that's very different, I think, than time-bound discussion of, uh, you know, what's good today is maybe not good tomorrow. Well, there's in Plato's view, there's a universal good, which belongs to the soul of the universe. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, great comments, James. Um, and you're raising for me a lot of the questions that I find myself wrestling with in light of, of our readings today. If you have a more materialist view of the human self, where the only progress you'll make as a person and the only reckoning you'll experience as a person is in this life that really changes the challenge of justice and i think makes it much worse because uh, for example right now in the united states we're having a lot of conversations again around the las vegas mass shooting because of, of recent supreme court rulings and you know that was a case where a shooter sprayed you know thousands of bullets into a crowd and then committed suicide immediately after. So th there's no chance of any of the kind of rehabilitative or reconciling processes that the Athenian is talking about here to occur because he's just dead. And if we don't have a view of the person fitting into a more eternal conception of justice and progress, then there there's really is no further story. There really is no way to tell a story about that concerning justice other than to say, well, let's try to learn from it and prevent that from happening again, which is kind of how the conversation in, in my country has gone. But in, in terms of that particular event and that particular wrongdoer, it's just a tragic situation. There is no justice for it. And so I think, you know, recognizing that the frame uh, that we bring to these discussions of justice about how, again, the metaphysics we have of what a person is, what a soul is, what a society is, what a cosmos is, is going to impact how we ultimately conceive of these questions of justice. And I thought your comments really brought that out nicely, James. Um, Darren? Yeah, just... I guess jumping off what James was saying. So I'm just going to tie this in with like the previous discussion about the, how do you put it? The conflict between the good and the just, the inconsistency, there we go, <laughs> between the good and the just in the language of the ordinary man. I think there are like several ways that I see that Plato is reconciling that here. It's interesting though, that Plato there's a lot of ways in which these are reconciled. For instance, in the previous discussion, he was saying that you always get the most pleasure or something. Being the good will always give you the most pleasure in the long run. That was maybe a more kind of secular <laughs> explanation he was referring to. And I remember I would say, look, okay, this, this doesn't work. I don't think that's true. And it's interesting that there's various attempts at solving, I think, the same problem <laughs> here and there. And so here, I mean, we see one way in which it can be resolved is this introducing the afterlife, basically. <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I guess a lot of religion does this. You know, it's um, justice and the good will be reconciled because if you act unjustly, you might have a lot of riches and, you know, people might worship you um, and you'll be popular in this world if you're super unjust. But, you know, you're going to get your just desserts in <laughs> the afterlife. Um, here, actually, it's different than the myth of Ur, right? I mean, I, I, maybe we're just jumping around too many different sections here but like on hang on this is on i just have the page number i have to find the actual stuff in this numbers on 871 um he talks about a different myth right but here it's the story i think this belongs in the preamble that if you do something unjust you will come back in the next life <laughs> mm. and the same thing that you did will happen to you so 
I don't know if that's exactly the same as the myth of Ur. I realized recently that I totally have to reread the Republic, so I'm totally up for doing that if anyone wants to do it together. I, I do think it is evoking a similar type of reincarnation cosmology. Mm. And although I would hesitate to use the phrase just desserts because that has a retributive flair where you, you're getting what's coming to you, I actually think the intention here is purgative that if you can't come to a place of regretting your evil deeds in this life then you will have the tables turned so that you come to regret them by being the recipient of your evil deeds the next go around does that make sense yeah i see that i have to think more about this but yeah i i, I see what you're getting at um so I think that's one way in which, you know, we can sort of square the circle or whatever you want to say between the good and the just. I think, I don't remember if we read the section where he talks about people who attempt to murder someone else, but then fails. Did we read that? The attempted murder, but then just by luck, they fail. Uh, no, that, that's not in the reading. Well, it, that's in book nine. Yes. Okay. But it's not in the, I didn't, I didn't read that. Okay. All right. Yeah. I just, I just don't remember if we touch on anything about luck. But Plato also is saying that, you know, I, I guess want to justify the idea that like if attempted murder is punished less severely than, you know, if you're actually successful. But that seems weird because that's just by luck that you failed. So there he helps himself to other things. He says that, oh, you know, he's the person is just as bad. He says um, he should be treated with no more respect than the killer and made to stand trial for murder, but we should have due respect for the luck that has saved him from total ruin. So he talks about the spirit that, you know, was having mercy on these people. And so that's why we should treat him less harshly because there's these spirits. So there, there are these like th these like devices, you might say, that, that he maybe is helping himself to. I think that was a very novel <laughs> solution to the problem of the world. Like that had never, I don't think I've ever actually heard of explicitly before. So it's interesting that th this, this is a new idea. You just have to help yourself to feel like this idea of like, we have to pay respect to those spirits that help these people. So we should punish them less. So, uh, okay, I'll just wrap up my comments. It, another thing I wanted to say about how Plato is resolving the seeming inconsistency, inconsistency between goodness and justice is like just through like, restructuring our concepts in a way. So we see a lot of that, you know, in what Michael was reading. And I just want to come back to this. Um, I think this was two readings ago. This idea that stood out to me, at least, um, which I think I want to highlight because I think it stands in contrast to certain maybe perceptions or misperceptions of Plato or stereotypes of Plato, maybe from other texts where he talks about that legal judgments and how they shouldn't be like decisions. He used the term that just stood out to me. They shouldn't be like decisions handed down by God, that we should provide reasons for why there is a position. So he says here, then when we impose the penalty on either, everybody will be able to appreciate the arguments for it and make some kind of judgment whether it is the appropriate penalty to have imposed or not. And then Clinia says that he agrees and he's like, so we should either demonstrate the validity of these judgments or just stop insisting that unjust acts are always involuntary. So this idea that these judgments have to be explained and given a basis and reason, I think there's the idea that legal decision making has to have a public face. I mean, I guess in, in contemporary political philosophy, it's called like the publicity of um, this kind of reasoning and discourse. So I think that's maybe counter to some perceptions of what Plato is. Yeah. So I, I, I found this sort of stood out, but anyway, I'm done. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I, I would uh, hesitate, you know, you're using a Rawlsian term. <laughs> I know my Rawls. Um, and I would hesitate to say that Plato is giving that kind of public facing reasons here, where it's something that all the different interests of society would find overlap. Um, it's not that, but it is the type of justification that if a person is themselves pursuing the forms of reason, they should be able to look at the preamble and say, oh, I don't need the law. I'll just conform because my reason motivates me. So there are going to be unreasonable people, namely people who have not been through the education system yet, 
who it may not speak to and it may not persuade. And in that case, they're going to have to be coerced into following the law. But the goal is to make that segment of the population as small as possible because we want most people to be participating in the common life um, voluntarily. So just to say very quickly that I didn't wasn't thinking anything like specific to Rawls. I guess by publicity, I just mean of this larger idea. So here it would be like these kinds of myths that I'm assuming that people already like understood or believed in. So they're they're public in the sense that they're reasonings that are available to like actual people. And well, but but the, they the may state. not they may not be of one piece though, right? It could be that some people can have the true rationale and other people have to get the noble lie because they're not they're never going to get it. So you give them a myth that's not really the truth, but gets them on board with the just society. OK, it's the spirit <laughs> of the law that's being related. Right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Just because I, th I think there has to be room for a noble lie in some sense, because I, at least at, I'm not saying for the truth of it, I'm saying for Plato, because Plato is just skeptical that you're going to get mass action where everybody buys into the true myth. And so he thinks like, you know, as Shakespeare had his peanut gallery, you know, you've got to have something for the peanut gallery to go along with what other people can actually understand. Uh, but yes, the, in some sense, you're trying to persuade everybody through these various means. And I just, I want to say here before we move on to the last reading, and I think I should probably just end by reading the final reading and then we'll, we'll close out. I, I want to really highlight, though, this passage here on your screen where he says, we may take action or simply talk to the criminal. We may grant pleasures or make him suffer. We may honor him or disgrace him. We can find him or give him gifts. We may use absolutely any means to make him hate injustice and embrace true justice. And I just want to point out First of all, how practical this is, and also how open-minded this is in terms of behavioral psychology. Um, nothing is being prescribed here as to what is the best means of getting somebody to embrace virtue. He's simply saying, whatever means are available to us that will actually achieve that goal and that's the important part that will actually achieve that purpose we will make use of them and so that i think leaves subsequent generations of plato readers a really free hand to say okay what does our best behavioral psychology say is actually the most effective ways to achieve virtue what Plato has the Athenian doing for us is giving us the goal. The goal is to find the means to rehabilitate people towards virtue. That's the thing we're trying to achieve. And once we're clear on that goal, then we can have the behavioral psychology debate about the best prudential means of achieving the goal. And I think that kind of openness is this is another place where we see the true pragmatism of Plato's idealism. And therefore, pragmatism and, and idealism do not need to be opposed. Okay, in the interest of time, I think um, we need to just wrap up. So I will read the closing passage. It's very short, where Plato has the Athenian give voice to this idea that all laws are to be judged by whether they serve individual interest or the common good. If they only serve individual interests, then they're not just laws. If they serve the common good, on the other hand, then they are just laws. So I'm going to go ahead and read this. The Athenian says, Let us assume we have completed our legislation concerning the training and education that the soul needs during a man's life. A life is worth living if these needs are met, but not if they are not. And the penalties that should apply in cases of death by violence. We have discussed too the training and education of the body and the related topics in this case. And the related topic in this case is the violent treatment, voluntary or involuntary, of one man by another. So far as we can, we must distinguish the various categories, see how, how many they are, and say what penalties will be appropriate for each. It looks as if this could properly form the next subject of our legislation. 
Even the biggest bungler you could find among would-be legislators would put cases of wounding and mutilation immediately after cases of murder. Woundings ought to be distinguished as murders were. Some are inflicted involuntarily, some in anger, some through fear, while others are committed voluntarily and with premeditation. A preliminary address must be given about all these categories as follows. So now we get another preamble. It is vital that men should lay down laws for themselves and live in obedience to them. Otherwise, they will be indistinguishable from wild animals of the utmost savagery. The reason is this. No man has sufficient natural gifts both to discern what benefits men in their social relationships and to be constantly ready and able to put his knowledge to the best practical use. The first difficulty is to realize that the proper object of true political skill is not the interest of private individuals, but the common good. This is what knits a state together, whereas private interests make it disintegrate. If the public interest is well served rather than the private, then the individual and the community alike are benefited. The second difficulty is that even if a man did get an adequate theoretical grasp of the truth of all this, he might then attain a position of absolute control over a state with no one to call him to account. In these circumstances, he would never have the courage of his convictions. He would never devote his life to promoting the welfare of the community as his first concern, making his private interests take second place to the public good. His human nature will always drive him to look to his own advantage in the lining of his own pocket. An irrational avoidance of pain and pursuit of pleasure will dominate his character so that he will prefer those two aims to better and more righteous paths. Blindness, self-imposed, will ultimately lead the man's whole being and the entire state into a morass of evil. But if ever by the grace of God some natural genius were born and had the chance to assume such power, he would have no need of laws to control him. Knowledge is unsurpassed by any law or regulation. Reason, if it is genuine and really enjoys its natural freedom, should have universal power. It is not right that it should be under the control of anything else, as though it were some sort of slave. But as it is, such a character is nowhere to be found except a hint of it here and there. That is why we need to choose the second alternative, law and regulation which embody general principles, but cannot provide for every individual case. And I just wanna, as a closing thought, say that I included this passage in part because this final paragraph um, really gives the lie to the popular slander that Plato is responsible for the fascisms of Italy and Germany in the middle of the 20th century. I think if we were more careful readers of Plato's text, we would see um, very much that he's arguing for something quite the opposite. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to James to close us out. Well, thanks so much, Michael, for organizing today's notes and for conducting today's meeting. Really good discussion. And I really like that uh, ending selection that you just read. I think it's very important to understand Plato's position that reason has universal power, nothing else. And so the danger of subjecting that, making it a slave of any one individual person, one person thinking that he can be the measure of all things um, is eminent. And I think that's where we started the laws in book 10. So book 10 is the book that comes after this. So that's a really good way to, to remind us of what was in book 10, that reason reigns supreme. And that's at the very core of the universe. And to say that in two weeks, so we've already done book 10, we did two meetings on book 10 to start off with. And so in two weeks, we'll move to book 11. So if you want to prepare that in advance, that's great. And I do want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, I can stay online for a casual unrecorded discussion for maybe 15 or 20 minutes if anybody's interested in doing that uh, since we've run over time. So I do want to invite everybody back in two weeks, and um, I'll end the recording now and look forward to book 11 in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs>